25 years ago, I learned to speak German. And I haven't spoken German for 24 years. So uh, out of respect for your language, I'm going to do this presentation in English. Uh, I hope that you will be able to understand me. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of things we're going to go through today. I would ask that you please hold your questions to the end. Uh, we are going to have a, a question and answer session for you then. Uh, I am Robert Randazzo. Um, I am the uh, chief cook and bottle washer at PMDG. Um, I have with me today uh, Vin Simone, who um, he just waved. But um, Vin is the, uh, the head of our 3D design and uh, also uh, in charge of our graphic arts department. The rest of the team is, uh, is at home. Actually, it's Saturday, so they should be working. Um, but um, we've got a couple things I'm going to go through today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where we have been, uh, where we are right now, and where we're going. In 2007 or so, um, we started to come to the conclusion that PMDG as an operation was really starting to get off track. Uh, we were losing focus on the types of products that you were interested in. Um, our customer service was not as good as we like. And we started to do some internal evaluation to decide um, how we were going to fix this and how we were going to change our direction to provide you with the products that you want and to make sure that you get the support from us that you need uh, when you need it. So we, uh, we made some staffing changes. There were some people that left and we brought in some people. Uh, we brought in uh, Alex Bashkatov, who had formerly been with PSS. Uh, we brought in uh, Henning Van Rensburg, who had been um, the, uh, the principal at Aeroworks, uh, the B200. We brought in Jason Brown, who uh, most of you had never heard of. Jason was someone that I met uh, at the ABSIM convention in 2007. And, um, so if you don't think that coming to these conventions might be worthwhile, talk to Jason because he is one happy guy right now. Um, and we also brought on, I forgot one, who else did we bring in? Thank you, we brought in Matt Kaprocki. Uh, Matt had worked with, uh, with Henning Van Rensburg at, uh, at Aeroworks. I brought Henning in um, and I told Henning that his challenge was to find a way to make better utilization of our development resources. We had Alex tasked immediately to the NG, and Henning was told, find a project, put, the, put the, uh, the, the code team to work, put the modelers to work, and your job is to come up with small projects to offset the big airline projects so that when we go through these troughs in our development cycle, the rest of the team has something to work on. And this is what Henning came up with. Um, and what was funny was the Henning called me and he said, I've, I've got an idea. He said, I've picked out an airplane that I think will be perfect. And then he hesitated and I said, what's the matter? And he said, well, it's, it's sort of an odd little airplane. And so I, in my head, I'm picturing, uh, you know, he's going to tell me he wants to do a Fiesler store show or something of that nature. And he said, no, he said, um, the problem we're going to have is that you probably are not going to be able to find many people who have flown one. And I said, what is it? He said, it's a Jetstream 41. So I said, Henning, you're in luck. I've got 4,000 hours of piloting command time in J-41s. Um, and I thought he was kidding me, but it turns out he didn't know that I had flown the airplane. So we put this airplane together, and this airplane was a technology testbed development project. Um, so this was Jason's first external model uh, at the commercial level. And um, we went down to a facility in Alabama um, or excuse me, in Arkansas, in the United States, to photo survey one of the airplanes that used to be owned by my airline. And we started a process uh, that we have employed on all of our projects since, and that involves photographing literally every square inch of the airplane. And you can see the results uh, here in the textures and, uh, and the, the surfaces of the airplane. We have, um, this is kind of hard to see on the screen, isn't it? Well, I'm going to point things out, and you're just going to have to pretend that you can really see the detail because uh, it's uh, a little bit, a little bit light. But what we did was, um, on previous projects, we noticed that with PMDG and, and most of our com competitors, this area of the airplane right here, the main panel, tended to be very, very clear. But if you looked away from the main panel to the sides of the cockpit or to the rear of the cockpit, 
The textures tended to be blurry. Uh, the modeling itself was very, was very low definition. We decided to change that with this project, and this was the first time that uh, we really put a lot of effort into modeling the areas that don't involve flying the airplane. Um, we put a tremendous amount of effort, in, and a lot of this was, uh, was Vin Simone's uh, work. We put a lot of effort into the, um, the cockpit displays. And although you can't really see it on this image, up in these corners here on this display is something that drives me absolutely crazy. Um, fingerprints and smudges. When I flew for a living, I used to bring a bottle of spray cleaner with me and I would clean the edges of these displays and I could never understand why pilots were sticking their fingers on them in the first place. When we were in Arkansas, I was telling Vin this story, and Vin thought, here's a way I can make him crazy. So there's fingerprints here that no matter how much cleaning I do, I can't get rid of. Um, on these, uh, the engine displays, we went into a tremendous amount of graphic detail. In these little areas right here, there's individual diodes that illuminate as the uh, as the engine parameters change. And again, this was a level of detail that we had not, we had not tried to achieve previously. Uh, and we did this in this airplane in order to see if it was possible. And we determined that it was. So then we moved this tech level of technology to um, a product that, I don't know, maybe one or two of you have, have flown this before. Um, but we put this into our NG. Uh, and this is the most ambitious development project we've yet undertaken. Um, this is one of my least favorite airplanes in the world. I think largely because I have spent tens of thousands of hours in this airplane behind a keyboard. The, um, when we get into the development of this airplane, one of the things that was very important to us was flight model fidelity. Uh, Dr. Vangelis Baos, who is our, um, our chief engineer, um, he spent almost a year developing the flight models for this airplane. We had, <clears throat> excuse me, we had flight model data uh, from the manufacturer. And getting Microsoft Flight Simulator to match the performance of the airplane is, is no small feat. But it, we did it well enough that uh, those of you who have flown this airplane uh, with winglets and without, uh, have you noticed that the airplane handles differently? If you haven't, try it. Fly the 800 with the winglets, and fly the 800 without. You'll notice a performance difference in the FMS, but the actual handling of the airplane is slightly different as well. Uh, one of our uh, technical advisors uh, flies the, uh, the 737 for uh, Jet Airways in India, and about three weeks ago, he um, had a tattletale inside the airplane, uh, uh, alert him to the fact that he had oversped the flaps. And when they got on the ground, they started to post op it and try to figure out why did we overspeed the flaps, and then he remembered, we're flying a 700 today, not an 800. And the 700 doesn't like to slow down. The, um, we've had uh, a number of people ask us, why didn't we give you a winglet option on the 600? There is no winglet option on the 600. Um, there is only one airline that, uh, that asked to put winglets on the airplane and Boeing said, you know, you're the only people that want it, so if, if you want to pay for the engineering, we'd be happy to put them on there for you. Um, so they declined. So this, this airplane is the only one that's offered uh, with no winglet package. The, um, we put a tremendous amount of this. We moved the detail work from the J-41 and brought it into the, uh, into the NG. Again, Vin went after the displays with fingerprints. This time he even took it a step further and added dust. I don't know if you've noticed that if you, if you look at the screens really closely and you change the lighting conditions just slightly, you can see dust and, and uh, dirt, things like that, things that shouldn't be in an airplane. Um, we've um, had a lot of folks talk to us about the, the wear and the weathering inside this cockpit, and, and we put a, a lot of effort into making this airplane look as though it had been in service. We photographed uh, the cockpit of a working airplane. Um, we uh, have a, an airline partner that was willing to give us access to their airplane for an entire day. Um, it, was a, it was sort of a fun photo exercise for us because it was about 22 degrees below zero and we had to leave the doors open. So um, we were all fairly cold. Uh, we've had a couple of folks ask us 
why is this area of the airplane so dirty? Um, we've had people tell us, you know, there's, this is unrealistically dirty. And the reality is, um, we actually had to clean these, these photographs up to use them as textures because this airplane was so filthy. Um, there's, in this image you can see there's a little bit of sand right here in the edge of this uh, of the transponder. When you get home, take a look at that closely, those of you that, that own this product. Um, Vin actually had to really dig down in, in, uh, uh, in Photoshop to get rid of some of the sand because there was so much of it. We thought there's no way you'd believe that there was that much dirt and grime in this airplane. Uh, but there was, so. Um, this right here, how many people here have flown the heads up display? Okay, how many people here have not flown the heads up display? Okay, those numbers should be equal, but they're not. How many people have not flown the heads up display? Stand up. Come on, stand up. All right, raise your right hand. Repeat after me. <laughs> when I get home, I will fly the heads up display. Um, I'm poking a little bit of fun at you, but I, but in all seriousness, this was the most difficult engineering accomplishment of the NG. Um, and the great part about this is I had nothing to do with it. So it didn't give me any headaches at all. But this right here is the brainchild of two people. Um, Alexei Bashkatov, who, uh, who joined us in 2008. Uh, Alexei had some ideas for how to make this work. And he gave those ideas to Vin, who, who's here, who I've introduced you to. And Vin spent, and I kid you not, four months. Every single day there were two or three new versions of this where they tried to solve some of the technical problems behind collimating this so that the, the projection would work as it does in the airplane. And the, the difficulty there was on a heads-up display, if you are looking at that display and you're inside the airplane, this little circle right here, uh, that's your, your that's your, your energy vector. That tells you exactly where the airplane's pointed. So if you stick that on the end of the runway and you move your head, it should stay on the end of the runway. And the difficulty is that in the flight sim world, when you would move your head, it would move with you. So that didn't really work very well. And Vin is the fellow who figured out how to collimate that and make it work as it should on the airplane. So when you're looking at that display, it is focused at infinity. And it appears to your eye as if it was projected on a screen that is 200 feet in front of the airplane and 100 feet wide and 50 feet tall. That's what it's supposed to look like, and it does. Um, so it was a, a significant engineering challenge. It took a tremendous amount of effort. And to be honest with you, about three weeks before we released, we thought we broke it, and we weren't sure if we were going to be able to do it. So, um, so this is, uh, uh, you know, if, if it works for us for another 10 years, this will probably remain his single, uh, his single biggest achievement. So, all right, that's what we've been. So where are we going? Uh, well, we have, um, uh, we've got a couple things in the works right now. Um, some of them you know about, but some of them you don't. I'm actually ahead of myself a little bit in, in time, which is sort of extraordinary because I'm, I made my career in airline management, so I'm always about 10 minutes late for everything. That was United Airlines, if anybody's interested. It's a